Now, if you will, take your Bibles and turn to Revelation 11. Revelation 11. I ask you, has anybody ever asked, has everybody, anybody ever said to you, the time has come? Yes, I got some nods. The time has come for you to get serious. The time has come for you to get serious about life. The time has come to get serious about your work. The time has come to get serious about education. I mean, we could go on for the next 35 or 40 minutes that the time has come. As we read our scripture today, we're going to discover in verse 18, in my translation, which we will read two times, it says, the time has come. Now, the older translation says, the time of the dead, and it talks about them being judged, and it says basically the same thing. The time has come. I want to give you, I want to remind you that we're in the book of the Revelation, for those who are here for the first time. The Revelation tells about God's end time uh, activities and judgment. You can go back to chapter 4 where the rapture happened, God's people caught away, the world left in chaos. Then we followed it through the seven seal uh, judgments where he snapped seals on a scroll. As that scroll was the title deed to earth. And between the sixth and seventh seal, there was a lull. And then it popped the seventh seal. And, at, and then we saw the seven angels stand, and they were given trumpets. And where we are now is six of those trumpets have sounded. Six of the trumpet judgments have sounded. And from chapter 10 to about 14, there is a lull. And here's what we're going to see today. We're going to see today that the seventh trumpet is going to sound. And the time has come. Because the time has passed. The time has come for the world to be judged because the time has passed for grace. The time has come for the world to move, for God to move forward in purifying the world because the time of his graciousness has passed. Let's read, uh, if, you, if you can and will, we're going to read these four or five verses, 15 through 19, chapter 11. Would you stand to honor the reading of God's holy word? The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The 24 elders who were seated before God on the throne fell face down and worshiped God saying, we give you thanks, Lord God, the Almighty who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. The time has come for the dead to be judged and to give the reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints, and to those who fear your name, both great and small. And the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder, an earthquake and severe hail. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, for the next few minutes, I pray that you would focus our attention on you. And I pray as, as we focus on you, I pray, Lord, that you will open our heart. That you will open our mind. That you will speak to us words that we need to hear. For some of us, we need to hear words of salvation today. Because you still offer it. Salvation that comes through your Son and faith in him. For those who need a touch of revival and renewal in their hearts, they've allowed themselves to kind of backslide away from you. I pray that today, Lord, that it'll be that day. But Lord, I pray that you will inspire us about the future and the control that you have and your desire. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This past week, we watched with anxiety as Hurricane Adelia came up the Florida coast, just hoping it didn't turn to the west and get us. 
But we watched as it headed toward Florida and Georgia. We watched the preparations going on. I mean, they prepared. The governor did a good job of getting them ready and prepared. Because you see, any time a storm is coming, preparations are required. We've been through that many times over here in Mississippi. As we look at the story today, we know that the storm of God's judgment is happening. Uh, the break between the sixth and seventh trumpet is now over. And now that seventh trumpet has sounded and the time has come. Now, verse 18 in my translation has that two trumpets, the time has come. But as I read and I studied and I prayed over these, uh, this passage, here's what I know. Is that this whole passage is about the time having come. So, if you've got your bulletin open, I just want to run around this story and let us learn the things that we need to learn about the time having come. The time has come, first of all, for recognition for recognition. If you look in verse 1, and all of these will be pulled directly from our scripture. In verse 1, the seventh angel, seventh angel blew his trumpet, and then John heard voices in heaven. Now, who was it in heaven speaking? It could have been the angelic choir. It could have been the saints, or it could have been the saints and angels of old. It could have been all the residents of heaven. He heard the voices, and what were they saying? I don't know whether they're saying or singing, but musicians will recognize this. The kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and of his Christ. Now, who is that? Hallelujah, chorus. You see, this is where Frederick Handel, George Frederick Handel, got the lyrics. The kingdom of this world had become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. It is a sound, a song of victory. And in this part, listen, he speak, they speak of two kingdoms and a king. Have you ever saw that? Two kingdoms and a king. It begins with the evil kingdom, the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of this world. It's an evil kingdom. It's a kingdom that you and I live in every day. It is the kingdom that pulls at us, that draws at us. And quite honestly, it's the kingdom that we fall in love with. That's why Jesus said, don't lay up yourself, for yourselves treasures on earth, because on earth you got moth, rust, and robbers. Don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Don't fall in love with the things on earth. Because they will disappear. It's talking about the evil kingdom in which we find ourselves today. It is ruled by the prince of the power of the air, the Bible calls him, none other than Satan himself. That's this kingdom. It's also speaking in the context of history. It's also speaking of the kingdom that, that the Antichrist had worked to build for three and a half years. Remember after the rapture, the white horseman, he, he brought peace to the land, and up to this point, he's been trying to be peaceable, but they're trying, they're going to revolt, and it's about to turn and get ugly. You see, the evil kingdom is led by an evil ruler. Today, we find ourselves in that evil kingdom. Then, the second thing he's talking about is the eternal kingdom. By the way, that, that evil kingdom will pass away. The rulers will be cast in the lake of fire. And then you get to the eternal kingdom that it speaks of. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord. Eternal kingdom. You see, here's the deal. It's not like Jesus rebuilds and restarts and, and gets somebody else's kingdom. It says the kingdom of this world, the evil kingdom, then becomes the kingdom of our Lord. And that's a great picture for us because he takes the evil and he... And he transforms it into an eternal kingdom. This eternal kingdom, while the evil kingdom is built on the principles of this world, the principles of rebellion, the principles uh, that Satan would have us, the eternal kingdom, when it's being transformed, is built on things like righteousness, love, peace, joy, faith, hope, 
goodness. You see, the, the kingdom of our Lord is built on things that literally please our Father. And oh, by the way, the reason I call this an eternal kingdom is because the Bible says, of this kingdom, there will be no end. You see, Jesus has the authority to transform everybody. And by the way, that picture should be for us too. He transforms this kingdom, Jude, but he transforms our heart. He comes in when our heart is evil. He comes into us who are basically evil. One of the problems with the modern day culture is that they, it seems that they see us as basically good people. And some of us buy into that. Yeah, I'm, we're basically good people. And if we just get enough things right, it'll be okay. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible tells us that we're evil in our heart, and it takes a heart change. It takes a heart transplant, and only Jesus can do that. He transforms us from the way we are to the way he wants us to be, to the way God designed us to be. And he only does that when we invite him into Jesus takes the evil king, kingdom and he transforms it into an eternal kingdom. You know why? Because he's the everlasting king. He's the first one on the scene, Genesis 1. He will be the last king standing, Revelation 22, 21. You see, this Jesus, this everlasting king, he is the one that we saw in Revelation 1. When John, remember John knew Jesus very well. In fact, at the Lord's Supper, at the Last Supper, he leant on his shoulder. He was sitting so close to him. And yet, as God was getting John ready to pen the revelation, he gave him a reminder picture of the glorified Jesus. And it was so startling that John fell down like a dead man. You see, brothers and sisters, it... When the seventh trumpet sounds, it's a time, the time has come to recognize that there's an evil kingdom, that there is an eternal kingdom, and that eternal kingdom is led by an everlasting king. Is that not something to get excited about? The second thing, the time has come, as we read on down, not just for recognition, but verse 16 is a time for rejoicing. Time for rejoicing. Folks, we should, I, man, Eric, I was blown away this morning. The singing was so good. We should never have to encourage God's people to rejoice. It should be as natural as the day is long. But look at here what happens. The trumpet sounds, and they fall on their faces. These guys who are seated on the throne, on their throne, they're in the throne room. They fell face down. How long has it been since you fell face down in worship? They fell face down, and they worshiped. This is what they said. Well, we give thanks to you, Lord God, the Almighty, who is, who was, because you have taken your great power, and you have begun to reign. You see, they were literally overwhelmed as the last trumpet sounded. Falling on their knees, falling on their face. They see this as creation's plan has finally unfolded. And they know, are you listening? They know who the champion will be. They know who will be there at the end. Do you? Do you know that person? The truth is, is that Jesus, Jesus is the reason for our rejoicing. The time has come today, brothers and sisters. We, I don't want to be offensive. I've said this before in other ways. But when we get to be a rejoicing people, when we really get to be a rejoicing people, when it shows on our face and it shows in our body language and we get to rejoice, we will not have to invite people to come and worship with us. They will want to be here because everybody wants to be a place where there's joy. We go to ball games. Now, I'm not going to mention all this, what, what went on Thursday and Friday. We had some winners and some losers, and it's all okay. It'll be good. But I'm going to tell you what you saw. You saw at the game pure joy, just having Fun because it's football. Why can't we have joy and fun in the Lord? By the way, I was, I was telling uh, Tevin Madeline 
uh, that I was talking to somebody the other day, and I was just kind of bragging on our young people. It's bragging on our young people. Have you thought about it? We, we have young people who play football, doing well. And we have people maybe that play in the band, doing well. But do you realize the three high schools that we have students in, West, Academy, Columbia High, do you realize the impact that our young people have there? Cheerleaders! Now, I'm going to say this, and you're going to correct me, because I just know who makes the call. But I'm telling you, as I looked, captain of the cheerleaders here for West, captain of the cheerleaders at Columbia here, three cheerleaders at CA. Folks, we have, we have young people who are leading the rejoicing, and it's over football. Now, I want to tell you, our young people are good. They'll lead rejoicing right here if we'll allow them. Hello? You see, it's time for us to be a rejoicing people. These guys around the throne, they knew something else was coming up, but they were giving thanks to the Father for, for who he was. You know, Paul, we don't give thanks just because when circumstances are good. Brother Jerry, I can't rejoice today. You don't know what's going on with me. Well, Paul was in prison, and you know what he said? He said, rejoice. And by the way, I'll say it again. Rejoice. You see, that's, that's the spirit here. It's time, the time has come for rejoicing. Even in the midst of struggle, the struggle here is temporary. When we know the Lord, the time has come for us to recognize who he is and to rejoice from the bottom of our heart. And by the way, there's nothing any worse than somebody that's put on rejoice. But I can tell you, I've watched our, our, our cheerleaders who lead the way. They don't put on anything. They just get out there and they rejoice. And they, by the way, they encourage you to come along and, and do it with them. It's going to be a great day. The time has come for recognition, for rejoicing. But never forget... This is my Father's world. This is his creation. And he holds us accountable. We can rejoice in the good stuff and the bad stuff. And there's, there's some bad stuff here. Because the time, as we read this, the time has now come in, in judgment for retribution. For retribution. You know that God's going to deal with sin. Here's what I know. There's some people, maybe some people in this room that don't believe God's going to deal with sin. They believe God's just going to live and let live. Truth is, the setup for this, we read here in verse 18, the nations were angry, but your wrath has come. The time has come for the Dead to be judged, I drop down, and the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. You see, all of this is, is a repeat of what the psalmist tells us in Psalm 2. We'll put it on the screen. It says, why do the nations rage? Why are the nations so angry? And then it says, why do the people plot? And here's the deal, it's all in vain. When we rage against God, when we plot against God, it's in vain. This is what happens. The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers of the earth conspire together with the kings against the Lord and his anointed one. I love this. Let's tear off the chains and throw off the ropes. That's what they all say. And the one in heaven, <laughs> he laughs at them and ridicules them. Brothers and sisters, here's what I want to tell you. Retribution's coming one day, one day for, that, for those who destroy the earth. Coming one day for those who have been so angry at God. But I'm just going to tell you, as you look at that verse, we just sang about it. We already had our chains torn off. My chains are gone. I've been set free. What a great, what a great way to add on to an old song of his amazing Grace. Now make no mistake today. The Bible tells us in Peter that God is not willing that any should perish. In other words, he wants everyone to be saved. He extends his 
hands of grace and mercy to you today. He invites you to be saved today. But as we get in this, in this scripture and we see the end of time, at this point, the time will have come that for those who refuse his offer, those who have turned their back, those who have played games, retribution awakes. The people who are outside of Christ are those who destroy the earth. The people outside of Christ are those who are literally angry because God's wrath is falling. He's been merciful, but the time has come. He's been patient, but the time has come. He's been loving, but the time has come. He's been gracious, but the time has come. And for those that still believe that God will just live and let live and he won't ever exact judgment, take you a quick trip through just the first part of the Bible. Genesis 6, he regretted he made man. He let Noah preach 120 years and then retribution came. Only seven people of the whole earth survived. Flip over a little further in Genesis and read about Sodom. Lot's family settled there. Retribution came. And even when he tried to get his family of four out, one was so in love with the culture that she had to look back. Read the story of the exiles, God's people out of Egypt. His hand of grace, he was feeding them with manna. He parted the water, he brought water from the rock. And they didn't listen to him, so you know what he did? He sent snakes. He opened the earth up and swallowed thousands, swallowed thousands of them. Because re- the time will come when retribution is the order of the day from a holy God. Truth is, here, the time has come for retribution. The nations and the people who turn their back on God. The time has also come here, you're going to love this, for reward. For reward. It's, it's still there in verse 18. It, after it says, the time has come for the, uh, time has come for the dead to be judged. And watch this. And to give the reward to your servant, the prophets. Your servants, the prophets, to the saints. And here we go. To those who fear your name, both great and small. Anytime the pastor mentions rewards, everybody's thinking about good works. And certainly good works will be a part of it at the judgment seat of Christ. Works that are good according to God's standard. But here's my question for you. If you think that good works are it. Is the good work, are the good works the object of your life? Or the outcome of your life? What are you talking about, Brother Jerry? Well, here it doesn't say that the prophets and all are rewarded simply because they're good works. It says, for those who fear his name. Do I need to repeat that? For those who fear his name. The truth is, it's all about his name. Scripture says a lot about fear in his name. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord prolongs your life. The fear of the Lord turns you from evil to good. 
And the fear of the Lord leads you to persuade others to fear his name. Brother Jerry, I don't really fear the Lord. Well, you will one day. You will one day. Because one day, when he appears and you stand face to face with him, you, like I, will realize our ineptness. We will realize our sinfulness in the sight of such holiness. And it won't be that he has to knock you down on your knees. It will be that you will just collapse to your knees and you will realize how holy he is. Why do you think the, why do you think the elders, the 24 elders fell on their feet when that, when that trumpet went off? They fell on their face at his feet because they realized who he was. They realized the holiness of his name. They realized the majesty of his name. They realized the power of his name. They realized who he was and who they are. It's like Isaiah 6. If you don't know Isaiah 6 from memory, I, ta- I encourage you to go home this afternoon and read it. It starts off, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, and the veil of his train filled the temple. And I will just say this. Before we get a vision of God, a lot of times something has to die in our life. Something or someone, in the year King Uzziah died, something or someone has to before we Before we get a vision, it might be our pride that has to die. It might be our gold that has to die. It might be our vision of the future that has to die. Sadly, I have seen people where it was another person that had to die. Their life didn't get right until that, that, that death happened. And then they realized who God really was. Your king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, and his, the veil of his train filled the temple. And he got a look at God, and he said, Whew. Woe is me. I am unworthy. I am unclean. I am undone. You see, when we see God, we will realize how small we are and how great he is. And then when he gives us a reward, we'll think, I don't think I deserve this. I'm thankful. He rewards people. He gives people the reward for those who fear his name. For those that don't fear his name, Jesus says you have your reward here on earth. Time for reward around the throne. Can't wait. One last thing I see here. The time has come for revelation. If you look down in verse 19, the temple of the Lord, the temple of God in heaven was opened. And look at this. The ark of his covenant appeared in the temple. There are flashes of thunder and lightning, excuse me, flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and earthquake and severe hell. All those sounds and sights will just to remind you how holy he is, how powerful he is. But here's what I want you to see about the revelation. The temple in heaven opened and there was the ark. Now the ark don't mean a lot to us unless you study the scripture. But the ark in the Old Testament was the visible manifestation of God's presence. That holy God was among them. In the Bible, it's called the ark of the covenant, the ark of his presence, the ark of testimony, the holy ark. Yahweh God had given instructions about how to build it, He'd given instructions about what would be inside it. He, he, was, he gave instructions about its sacredness of it. He, he gave instructions about handling it. In fact, if you want to know how holy it was and how sacred it was, Yuza, I'm trying to remember the scriptures, 2 Samuel 6, Yuza saw the ark about to fall and reached out and touched it to steady it. And he died because God said, don't do that. 
And you go, well, that wasn't fair. You're not God. You see, he gives us his word for reasons. The ark was powerful. I remind you, Joshua 1, Joshua, I think it's 3, excuse me, when they were going into the land of promise. You talk about faith. Those priests were carrying the ark in front of the people. The river Jordan was out of its banks. It gives you a picture. Think about Pearl River out of its banks, about 22 or 23 feet. The priests went down and marched into the river Jordan holding the ark. And when their feet touched the water, the water parted. It's power. When they marched, all of us sang, sang the song, Joshua, the Battle of Jericho. And we've always all heard the story about marching around seven times and then hearing the trumpets. But you know what was in front of the trumpets? The ark. The ark. Power in the ark. One time a pagan people got captured the ark. And you know what? They all began to die. Because the power in the ark, the power of God's presence. You see, the truth is that the ark speaks of the powerful presence of the Lord. And as we see it in the temple, it's being revealed to us that God is among us. May I just say this, what's revealed in, in verse 19 is what God desires for us today, you and me, as a church. For the ark of the presence of the holy God to be in us. If holy God is in us every day, our lives should be different. I say that, and I know. People go, oh, well, that's true. You know, I was told when I got saved that, that the Holy Spirit resides in me. Well, here's what I want to ask you. If the Holy Spirit's in you and residing in you, is he really walking with you? Is he talking through you? Is he speaking every day? I dare say that we've been taught so long and hard that the Holy Spirit is with us and in us that we just dismiss it. He's just there. And I don't believe there is one place in Holy Scripture where the Holy Spirit is and people don't know it. If he is in us, he makes a difference for us. The time has come for God's people to live in the presence of holy God. Yes, the book of the Revelation is about the future. But the book of the Revelation is about the present. Young people, you carry Jesus to school with you makes a difference. Not so young people, you carry... You carry Jesus to work with you, it makes a difference. Old people, wherever you go, you carry Jesus with you, the Holy Spirit with you, and it makes a difference. It makes a difference how you live, how you walk, how you treat people, how you act. And it is the difference that people will notice because this world is not full of the Spirit. God's people are the ones that can show who God is. Today, if God's Holy Spirit is walking in you, you are showing people Jesus. You're the light of the world. Light shouldn't be hidden. It should be put on a mountaintop. Let your light shine. That's the Holy Spirit. Let your light shine in such a way that people will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Is that how you're living your life? There may be somebody here who's never invited Jesus into your life, so you don't have a clue in the world what I'm talking about. Well, just a little bit, Brother Kevin will be over here, I'll be over here. We want to talk to you about that. We'll be glad to talk with you about how you can invite Jesus into your life. Some of us have been walking in carnality. That's what Paul called it for years. And today could be a change of direction where we walk in the Spirit. Is he speaking to you? Is he calling you? Let's pray together.